today's topic uh, from pediatric side is uh, congenital or synoptic heart disease. So, before beginning, this is the thought of the day. Do the right thing even when no one is watching. So it's called integrity. I hope all of you are maintaining your own integrity sitting home by studying and listening all these lectures. So, in today's topic, these are the objectives. Why do we suspect congenital or synoptic heart defect? How do we suspect means? What are the signs and symptoms? Then what is the type of the congenital or synoptic defect? Then which defect require actually surgical intervention? And then what is the, or when it is operated, what is the timing of the surgery? So why it is important to know congenital or synoptic heart defect? If you know the incidence of, overall incidence of all congenital heart defects, so it is 8 to 12 per thousand live births. So in percentage it is 0.8 to 1.2 percent. So congenital heart defects they are broadly divided into two categories: a synoptic heart defect and the synoptic heart defect. If, if you see the percentage of the each of these types, most common is the VSD, which is 30 to 35 percent. Then Next most common is the ASD, then PDA, then uh, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, optation of aorta, approximately 5 to 7 or up to 8 percent. Then the less common uh, or synoptic heart defects are heavy septal defects and other uh, obstructive or regurgitant defects. So majority of the congenital heart defects they are asynotic and they require one time intervention and their overall prognosis, if timely operated, is good or excellent. Among synoptic heart defects, most common, all of you know, is tetralogy of failure, then detransposition of great arteries, and other complex congenital heart defects. So, these are the congenital heart defects. What you also know is the Acquired heart diseases, which are the acquired heart diseases in pediatric. At least remember uh, three names rheumatic heart disease, infective endocarditis, and Kawasaki disease, which involves the coronary artery aneurysm. So, in today's, so why it is important to know con congenital or synoptic heart defects? Because most of them are uh, benign lesions and require one time surgery and their oral prognosis is excellent. So how do we suspect congenital or synoptic heart defects? So on history, if the child is coming with history of repeated respiratory drug infection, failure to thrive, or there is increased sweating, circulation cycle, or it's, or we are suspecting any genetic syndromes, or there is a consanguinity of marriage, or any family member who is having congenital heart defect. So, on this history, we have to suspect there is a possibility of congenital heart defect in our child. So, what are the so what are the suggestive cardiac failure? Then, who are less than that? Abnormal second heart sound, abnormal blood pressure, uh, abnormal ECG, abnormal chest X-ray. So, any one major criteria or any two minor criteria suggest there is a presence of the heart disease. So, if there is a suspicion, we have to further evaluate to confirm the diagnosis by 2D echocardiography. So, what will be the type of the heart defect? So, today's discussion will be limited to the congenital or synoptic heart defects. So, they are broadly divided into left to right shunt lesions, obstructive lesions and very rarely regurgitant lesions. Uh, which are present since birth. So, left to right shunt lesions they are also called congenital or synoptic heart defects with increased pulmonary blood. And obstructive lesions with uh, regurgitant lesions they are called uh, congenital or synoptic heart defect with decreased pulmonary blood. Because by this classification their presentation will be different and their, their management will be different. So, in left to right shunt lesions most common all of you know is VSD, then atrial septal defect, then AV canal defect, uh, it is also called 
AVSD that is atrioventricular septal defect or there is other name is endocardial effusion defect. Then patent ductus arteriosus. Then other rare left to right shunts like AP window, rupture of sinus of ulcer or aneurysm, then coronary artery tissue. Obstructive lesions, pulmonary stenosis, aortic stenosis, palpation of aorta. Regurgitant lesions like mitral valve prolapse, pulmonary wall insufficiency or absent pulmonary valve or congenital tigris with regurgitant lesions. So, in today's topic we are discussing only left to right shunt lesion because it is difficult to cover all these lesions. In next part we, we are discussing obstructive lesions. So, before starting left to right shunt lesions or the shunt lesions in unsynotic congestion heart defects. I hope all of you know the basic anatomy of the heart. So, there are two major systemic veins which are superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. They carry the deoxygenated blood from the body and that comes ultimately in the right sided chambers. It comes first in the right atrium. It flows across the tricuspid wall goes into the right ventricle and it is ejected into the pulmonary artery and it is supplied to the lungs through the two uh, right and left pulmonary arteries. So deoxygen blood is coming into the right sided chambers and without mixing normally it goes into the lungs for the oxygenation. After oxygenation that blood comes into, into the left atrium through four pulmonary veins and that flows across the mitral wall goes into the left ventricle from left ventricle it is ejected across the aortic wall into the aorta then it is supplied to the different parts of the body these are the three major branches of the arch of the aorta first one is the right brachial oh sorry first one is the brachiocephalic artery then next one is the left common carotid artery and the third branch is the left subclavian artery. So, there is no mixing between these two chambers, right sided chambers and left sided chambers. What are the shunt lesions? If this blood mixes from left side to the right side, so they will give the features because of the increased pulmonary blood. So, today we are discussing left to right shunt lesions. So, already this classification I mentioned in the previous slide. First is the among that we will discuss ASD, VSD and uh, PDA in detail and other 3-4 uh, uh, left to right shunt lesions we will just see what is their anatomy. ASD so it is at name itself says it is a atrial septal defect there is an interatrial septum if there is a shunt across this or communication between the right and left atrium across this interatrial septum that is called atrial septal defect. So there are three major types of the ASDs. Most common is the ostium secundum ASD. Then other types are ostium primum ASD and sinus venous ASD. These are in the formation formation of interatrial septum. There is a appearance of the septum primer primum initially, which uh, migrates towards the AV walls or towards the AV cushions then there is a gap which is left over which is covered by the appearance of the septum secunda. So in between these two septums there is a one wall which uh, guides the flow during fetal circulation from right atrium into the left atrium that is that wall is called wall of foramen ovae. So, if you see the three types of uh, ASDs, most common is the ostium secundum ASD. So, ostium secundum ASD is nothing but the, the ASD which is exactly located at the middle of the interatrial septum along the uh, wall of foramen ovary or the uh, PFO. So, that is called ostium secundum ASD. So, it is the defect though the name is secundum ASD but actually it is the defect of the septum primum. Then next type is the ostium primum ASD. Ostium primum ASD means when that uh, septum primum uh, touches the endocardial cushions downwards, if there is a shunt 
which is left over across that fusion that is called ostium primum ASD. Then less common is the sinus venosus ASD. Sinus venosus ASD is located at higher position or posterior uh, part of the interactive septum. So at the SVC and right upper pulmonary vein junction near the interactive septum. So this is the least common uh, type of sinus venosus ASD and most of the time it is associated with the partial anomalous uh, venous return or it is also called PAPVC which is least common. Why it is PAPVC is there in sinus venous type of ASD? Because right upper pulmonary vein which drains into the left atrium just on the left side of the interactive septum. On the right side, uh, side of the interactive septum SVC which connects to the right atrium. If this portion in between these two vessels, if this upper portion is deficient, then there will, there will be the mixing that uh, pulmonary veins blood is coming into the right atrium. But only one pulmonary vein which is draining into the right atrium through, through that defect. So that's why it is called partial anomalous venous rate. So these are the some pictures of the different types of the ASD. Most common is the ostium secundum ASD. So it is situated exactly in the middle of the interatrial septum. There are good surrounding rings or there, are, there is a good surrounding structure of the interatrial septum. So this type of ASD we can uh, fix or close by device because that surround, surrounding structure will hold the device. So this then this is the sinus venous type of ASD which is located at higher position, uh, upper part of the interatrial septum. And uh, primum ASD which will be located just near the AV walls like tricuspid or mitral wall. So ostium primum ASD is located uh, lower part of the interatrial septum. Second ASD is located exactly middle part of the interatrial septum and sinus venous type of ASD usually it is located higher. So these are the eco images of the uh, different types of ASD. You can see this is this is the interactual symptom. This is left atrium. This is right atrium. And this middle portion is absent. This is second and type of ASD. Now this is primum ASD or ostium primum ASD. This is heart is uh, in eco we see heart upside down. So these are the upper portion of the ventricles lower portion of are the atria and this is the interactive septum. If this defect which is seen near the AV walls, these are the AV walls, that is called ostium primum ASD. And at the middle of the interactive septum, if wall is seen flapping in LA and RA and it is small in size, the defect is small in size, especially it is seen in uh, newborn babies or uh, early infancy, this is PF, so they are not hemodynamically significant and they don't need any treatment. And this is the sinus venous type of ASD which is located exactly at the upper portion of the interactive sector. So you can see this SVC right upper pulmonary vein, both are coming and their blood is getting mixed and ultimately coming into the right atrium. So, sinus venous type of ASD, as pulmonary venous blood is coming into the right atrium, they can be associated with the partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. So what are the clinical signs and symptoms in case of ASD? So ASD is a low pressure shunt because left atrial pressure and right atrial pressure differences across the ASD is very minimal. So these patients usually are asymptomatic. In later childhood, they may have an easy fatigue ability or there is a mild growth failure. Sometimes they can remain undiagnosed also. So over the period of time, second, third or fourth decade, that shunt can get reversed and there will be the Eisenmenger physiology and they can have a sinusis also. So it is also possible they remain undiagnosed and directly present with the sinusis during third or fourth decade of life. So what are the signs on cardiovascular examination? So there will be the hyperactive precordium, right ventricle, he will be present. 
second heart sound has typical characteristic it is fixed widely split second heart sound murmur there are two types of murmur are possible systolic murmur which is soft systolic which is uh, we can appreciate at left parasternal border or in pulmonary area and there is a possibility of flow murmur which is mid diastolic murmur which is heard in again left parasternal but little lower side so the my question is what produces this murmur are they shunt murmur or they are murmur because of the flow so there are two possible murmurs are there systolic murmur which is based heard in the pulmonary area that is because of the increased pulmonary blood flow across the pulmonary wall but shunt itself does not produce any murmur then mid diastolic murmur is there because of the increase blood flow across the tricuspid wall during the diastole so that gives rise to mid diastole murmur so asd uh, itself does not give a murmur but the increase flow across the tricuspid wall and across the pulmonary wall can give a murmur
So we have discussed up to uh, clinical features of atrial septal defect. So my question was, what was the? What was the? What is the cause for the normal in case of atrial septal defect? So. What part of this systolic and diastolic murmur in case of active chapter defect? Okay? So it is not because of the ASD itself. It is because of the increased flow across the pulmonary wall that causes a systolic murmur and diastolic murmur is caused by the increased flow across the tricuspid wall, which is significant. The ratio is more than 2 as 1. So what are the test X and ECG findings in case of atrial chapter defect? So ECG will show the features of right atrial enlargement due to volume overload. So this is seen as a tall P wave, especially in the uh, right side chest nerves, P1 wave. And there will be the right ventricular hypertrophy, right axis deviation, and then characteristic RS R dash pattern because of the, there is a right ventricle volume overload. This is again seen in lead V1 in which R wave is prominent compared to the yes wave and again there are possibilities of tachyarrhythmias especially in the osteum primum type of ASD. So you have to really see for the abnormal rhythm in ECG. So this is the chest x -ray. Chest x really doesn't show, the, does not show any really significant cardiomegaly but definitely there is an increased pulmonary blood loss. So what is the treatment of atrial septal defect? So we have to close or some or the other time. So ASG with left to right shunt with evidence on echocardiography of right ventricular volume overload without evidence of irreversible pH. So such with ASG we have to close. What is the contraindication of closure? If there is a pH already established and which has uh, come to the stage of irreversibility, then we are not closing such ASDs. What is the ideal age for the closure of the ASDs? If patient is asymptomatic and incidentally diagnosed as a case of ASD, usually it is close in 2 to 4 years of age. Sinus venous ASD, we can close little uh, late 4 to 5 years of age. If patient is having symptoms of uh, respiratory tag infection or easy particularity or there is a circular research cycle, such symptomatic patient which is rarely seen in infancy, but maybe around 2 to 3 years of age, we can close when they develop the symptoms. If they remain undiagnosed and present late in uh, childhood, when they are diagnosed and on ECO there is a evidence of uh, right side volume overload, we have to close irrespective of the age. What is the method of closure? So, we have taken a decision of close the VLG, but how it is closed? So there are two uh, methods of ASD closure, one is surgical 
and then the device closure. Surgical is the preferred uh, choice for the ASD closure. Then uh, device closure, it is possible only for the ostium second ASD. As earlier I said, we have discussed that ostium second ASD, they are located exactly at the middle of the interactive system. So there is a good surrounding structure to hold the device and for that child has to be at least 3 to 4 years of age with weight of more than 15 kg. So after the closure, we have to follow this patient. In surgical closure, we, we are following this patient every 2 to 3 months up to 1 year post-operative. Today. And if there is no residual shunt or there is no pulmonary artery hypertension, there is no arrhythmia, then no need for the further follow In case of ASD device closures, because that is a device is foreign to the body view, there are chances of the thrombus formation near the device in the atria. So we have to do antiplatelet medication for up to six months. So antiplatelet medication, right? Aspirin, aspirin in the dose of 3 to 5 mg per kg uh, per day, single dose or uh, clopidogrel is also used as an antiplatelet agent. Then this patient after device closure, we have to follow up 3 times in first year, then every 3 to 5 years. But any time if they develop cardiac symptoms or uh, their symptoms suggestive of arrhythmia, then they can follow in between. Mortality is less than 1%. So ASD if timely diagnosed, timely intervene, they, they are having excellent prognosis. So, my question is, what is required in case of ASD? So the answer is, it is not required because it is a low pressure patient. There are no chances of developing endocarditis. Now we are discussing ventricular septal defect. This is the commonest congenital heart defect. It is seen almost 30 to 35 percent of among all congenital heart defects. So it is the defect in the interventricular septum. You can see this is the interventricular septum. This is the right ventricle, this is left ventricle, and this is the VSD, which is located exactly at the middle. This is middle muscular VSD. What are the, what are the types of the ventricular septal defect? So, this is the inlet portion of the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. This is the cut section we are seeing from the right ventricle side. This is the inlet portion. Uh, blood coming from the right atrium comes across the tricuspid wall into the right ventricle. And this is membranous portion of the interventricular septum. And this is the muscular portion of the interventricular septum. If VS is located at, at this location, then it is membranous or perimembranous VS. If it is located below this uh, membranous portion but into the muscular part of the septum, this is called inlet VSD. If defect is in, located in the muscular part of interventricular septum but exactly at the middle of the septum, this is called middle muscular VSD. If it is located towards the apex, then it is called apical muscular VSD. And there are many uh, such uh, VSDs are there, they can give a Swiss cheese epidermis. This is also called Swiss type, Swiss cheese type of VSD. If VSD is located in the outlet portion, this is pulmonary artery. If VSD is located uh, in the outlet muscular part of the interventricular septum, they are called outlet muscular VSDs or they are also called supracrystal VSDs because they are located uh, in the above the crista supraventricularis. Crista supraventricularis is a ridge which separates the smooth outflow tract of the right ventricle from the trabeculated white part of the right ventricle. If VSD is located above this uh, supra, uh, crista supraventricularis, it is called supracrystal VSD. What are the additional features of this supracrystal VSD? As they are located closer to the semilunar walls, there are chances of the aortic or pulmonary regurgitations. So these are the types of the VSDs. Uh, four types, perimembranous VSD, which is most common, muscular VSD, then outlet muscular or supracrystal VSD, and inlet VSD. Inlet VSD can be a part of AV septal defects. So most common is the perimembranous VSD, and muscular VSD, 
among perimembranous and muscular VSD, muscular VSD they are likely to get close spontaneously. If you see your hemodynamics, so they are shunting, VSD shunt initially left to right because uh, systemic vascular resistance is very very high compared to pulmonary vascular uh, resist resistance. So they flow left to right, all this blood comes into the right ventricle and it goes into the pulmonary vasculature and this extra volume is coming back coming back into the left atrium and left ventricle so there is a left atrial left ventricular dilatation will be seen and there is a left sided chamber volume overload will be seen so how do they present BSD patient so again similar features but this is the high pressure shunt usually the uh, the VSD patient present early in childhood. So they can have a congestive heart failure or there is a poor weight gain. They can have a recurrent respiratory infection because of increased pulmonary blood flow or they can have a circulation -circ cycle. They feed, then rest in between, again latch. So there is a circulation -circ cycle which is characteristic of left to right shunt lesions. And they can have a exercise intolerance. So small VSD, small to moderate VSD of size 3 to 6 millimeter. So they are usually asymptomatic and there are high dances, they will close spontaneously by 1 to 2 years of age. But moderate and large VSD almost always have symptoms and they require early surgical intervention. On cardiovascular examination, there will be the hyperactive precardia. Symptoms develop between 1 to 6 months. So hyperactive uh, precardium can be seen in one to six month period, and there is a characteristic polosystolic or pan-systolic murmur, grade at least grade three by six, which is better heard in left parasternal area, and this murmur may be absent in large VSDs because large VSD there is an equalization of pressure between right ventricle and left ventricle, so hardly there is any flow. So that won't give any marble, but patient will be symptomatic. Then there will be the diastolic murmur, which is mid diastolic murmur, based on in the mitral area. This is flow murmur, and they tend to have a pulmonary artery hypertension very rapidly. So pulmonary component of the second heart zone will be loud. So this is X-ray and ECG of VSG patients. So you can see in the ECG. These uh, R waves are prominent in the lateral chest leads, so that suggests there is a left ventricular hypertrophy. And also Q waves are also prominent in lateral chest leads. This is because of left ventricular volume overload. And in X-ray you can say there is obvious cardiomegaly and there is a increased pulmonary vascularity. So these are the characteristics on ECG and chest X-ray in case of VSDs. So, diagnosis is confirmed by 2D echocardiography and color doppler examination. You can see, so the blood is shunting across the interventricular septum because there is a mid muscular VSD. The second photograph of the perimembranous VSD, this is RV, this is LV, and this is IOD. So, VSD is located at this position, it is perimembranous VSD. This is the third image is of color doppler of the same perimembranous VSD. So, what are the indication and timing of VSD closure? So, small VSDs without any symptoms on echocardiography, normal VA pressure, normal left heart chambers, and there is no aortic regurgitation or there is no pulmonary regurgitation, means there is no cus prolapse. Then, these small VSDs we can follow every 2 to 3 years up to 10 years of age. So, there is closure is not indicated in this patient if everything is normal and they are asymptomatic but we require to follow them every second or third year every two to three years but anytime if they develop endocarditis or cusp prolapse with aortic regurgitation and significant right or right ventricle outflow type obstruction then we have to close small VSD also moderate VSD we have to close definitely if they are, they are asymptomatic we close by 2 to 5 years of age 
if they are having symptoms, then they are close uh, around one to two years of age. Large age is definitely we have to close as early as possible. So large age is diagnosed and their uh, congestive heart failure is not controlled with medication. So we have to close as early as possible. So which are the medication which are used in the treatment of large VSD congestive heart failure? You have to decrease the preload by furosemide and uh, spironolactone. Enalapril is used to increase the left ventricular stroke volume and uh, decrease the shunt across the VSD. Deoxin can be used uh, to control the tachycardia. So, if the CCF is not controlled with all this medication, then as soon as possible we have to operate this uh, VSD. If symptoms are controlled in large VSD with all this medication, we can wait up to 6 months of age. But by 6 months of age, we have to close this VSD. Any VSD with aortic regurgitation, surgery is indicated immediately. Contraindication for VSD cutter is again severe pH, which is irreversible. So, how do we close? So, conventional patch closure is the proper method of VSD closure. So, pericardial patch is used to close this uh, VSD. Then device closure. In case of mid muscular VSD, VSD is located exactly at the middle of the interventricular septum and there is a surrounding structure which are there to hold the device. So they can be closed with device. What is PA bending? PA bending is nothing but uh, there is a ring which is applied uh, outside of the pulmonary artery to limit the pulmonary blood flow. So this is palliative uh, measure. This is not a definitive uh, surgery. But in cases of large uh, multiple VSDs or VSDs which are inaccessible for the closure or there are contraindication for cardiopulmonary bypass, we have to bend the pulmonary artery and later on if situation is favorable then we close uh, such VSDs. So follow after surgical closure, up to one year, so we have to follow this patient. If everything is okay, there is no residual shunt, there is no pH, there, is, there are no arrhythmias, then after one year, there is no need for the further follow. If there is a device closure for the VSD, again similar thing, you have to do antiplatelet medication daily up to six months to prevent the thrombus formation. Then echocardiography follow up is indicated two to three times in first year then you get 3 to 5 years. Now third, we are discussing patent ductus arteriosus. So, patent ductus arteriosus, all of you must be knowing. So, all of you must be knowing uh, normal fetal cir circulation. So, ductus arteriosus is the important uh, part of fetal circulation. In this image you can see, so this is RV, this is pulmonary artery and these are the two branches of the pulmonary artery. Then we can see the third branch of the pulmonary artery which is ductus arteriosus. It joins the descending aorta. So in fetal circulation this ductus arteriosus patency is important because ductus arteriosus patency is an in integral part of your uh, fetal circulation. But after the birth it closes because fetal circulation changes to the new, newborn circulation. So it closes uh, by usually 3 to 7 days of life. But if it remains open, then it is a, it creates the left to right shunt between the systemic uh, vessels and uh, pulmonary vessels. And the patient can present with the congestive heart failure. So normally it closes during first week of life it accounts some most stable person of all congenital heart defect and also in almost 10 percent of other uh, CSDs it can be present and that plays a critical role means these such complex congenital heart defect they are drug dependent lineage. most common it is seen in the females most common association of patent ductus arteriosus are coaptation of aorta and VSDs so my question is Which torch infection is PD associated with? So, answer is congenital rubella syndrome. 
of our fuel must be known. There are three components of congenital vibrio syndrome. One component is being the congenital heart defect. So most common is a patent ductus arteriosus. So in dynamics, as we see, there is a higher aortic pressure. Because this higher aortic pressure, blood shunt across this PDA in left to right direction and it blood comes into the pulmonary artery. So this quantum of the blood depends on the size of the shunt and the interplay between pulmonary vascular and systemic vascular resistance. In small, if size is small, around 2 or 3 millimeter, pressures in pulmonary artery, right ventricular, right atrium will be normal. But in large PDA patient, pulmonary pressure increases and it almost equalizes to the systemic pressure. And over the period of time, that can lead to the pulmonary vascular disease. So, features, clinical features of patent ductus arteriosus are exactly similar with that of the VSD. So, what are the features? Small PDS can be asymptomatic, but large PDS they can present with the similar features like congestive heart failure or there will be growth restriction or there is a poor weight gain. On examination, peripheral pulses will be bounding and there will be the white pulse pressure on if you take a blood pressure because diastolic pressure will be less. So, the gap between systolic and diastolic pressure will be increased. This is the characteristic of patent ductus arteriosus and uh, apical impulse can be prominent. And there is a characteristic murmur which is continuous machinery murmur in pulmonary area. So, continuous machinery murmur in pulmonary area is the hallmark of the patent ductus arteries. Because why there is a continuous murmur? Because this blood through the ductus arteries shunts beyond system the early part of the diastole or throughout the diastole also. That's why we hear a continuous murmur. There will be the mid-diastolic murmur at the apex because there is a, all this blood coming back into the left side chambers. So, this extra blood will give rise a murmur across the mitral wall that is mid-diastolic murmur. So, when you close PDA, Large and moderate PDA with symptoms definitely you have to close as early as possible by 3 months of age. Moderate size PDA in which there may be a symptomatic but on equal there is a left heart or volume overload will be there, they will be close in between 6 months to 1 year of age. Small PDA we can close at 1 to 1 and a half years of age. Tiny PDA without any symptoms. Incidental detection on echocardiography. There is no pH, closure is not recommended. So it is decided by the cardiologist who are performing acute echocardiography. So contraindication will be similar if there is a severe pH with irreversible pulmonary vascular disease, then no need the PDA is not closed. Again, similar methods of closure surgical and device closure. Surgical is the preferred uh, method. Device closure, it can be uh, done in children who weigh at least 6 kg and it is less in age. What are the recommendation for follow? Again, this patient are followed uh, up to one year post intervention. If there is no residual shunt, then there is no need for the further follow. Now, PDA in uh, small babies, preterm babies, preterm babies mean if they are born in less than 37 weeks, so likely they are having patent ductus arteriosus. But there are high, again high chances that PDA close spontaneously, but it doesn't get close spontaneously and they have a congestive heart failure. So, you have to close this PDA uh, medically. So, which are the drugs which are used in the closure of patent ductus arteriosus, endomethacine and ibuprofen. And nowadays paracetamol is also approved drug for the PDA closure. If there are, we have tried medical closure for 3 days and such 2 courses have been tried and still the PDA is patent, then we have to close it surgically. So, surgical ligation is preferred if there is a failure for the medical care. If there is a small PDA, 
and you see modality not significant then prophylactic indomethacin ibuprofen ibuprofen is not recommended then other uh, shunt lesions will seen uh, brief so what is avsd avsd is atrioventricular septal defect the other name for avsd is endocardial fusion defect so if you see in this image uh, this is the portion in between the interventricular septum and interventricular septum so during embryological formation of the heart there are two endocardial fissions which forms the membranous septum that membranous septum form the part of the interventricular septum also and um, part of the interventricular septum also and again this portion this endocardial fusion they also form the septal leaflets of tricuspid wall and again part of the mitral wall also in these two endocardial fusions they don't meet or they don't fuse with each other then what are the possibilities so there will be the asd which is ostium primum asd there will be the vsd which will be inlet type of asd and there are possible av wall regurgitation most commonly will be the mitral regurgitation there are various type of the av septal defect or endocardial fusion defect that we are not discussing but uh, i wanted you to know what is avsd avsd is nothing but the combination of asd vsd and mitral wall regurgitation it is present in almost 4% of all congenital heart defect this is the eco image of the complete av septal defect in complete avsd all these three core components are present there is a huge shunt or the huge uh, communication is there between all four chambers this is avsd so the question my question is which genetic syndrome or disease is associated with avsd most commonly so all of you know it is trisomy 21 or down syndrome all of you are knowing that down syndrome most common csd or congenital heart defect is endocardial fusion defect that is nothing but the av septal defect it is seen almost 25% of uh, downs babies then other shunt lesions are ap window ap window is aorto pulmonary window now what is ap window now after pulmonary artery and aorta they originate from the respective ventricles they are located near to each other and there is a septum which separates aorta from the pulmonary artery at their base which is called spiral septum if this septum is having defect then there is a huge communication between the two great vessels so deoxygenated and oxygenated blood getting mix at this level that is called ap window or aortic pulmonary window so this is the communication so what are the clinical features of this so they have a similar presentation as that of large pd so as soon as diagnosis is established by 2d echocardiography we have to close them immediately what is rsva rsva is the other uh, one more uh, left to right shunt region it is rupture of sinus of pulsalva aneurysm so we have to know what is sinus of pulsalva now in this picture it is shown the aorta so this is the portion of the aorta which joins the left ventricle so uh, there is a origin of the right and the left coronary arteries these are the branches of the ascending aorta just in that portion aorta is dilated and there are three dilatations are present across the uh, semilunar wall which is inside uh, aortic semilunar wall so this three dilatation are sinuses of valsalva because when the aortic wall opens and closes during systole and diastole so there has to be 
blood flow should be maintained into the coronary artery. So there, there are tubular dilatation across uh, origin across the origin of the coronary arteries. If this portion is ruptures, it can get communicated with the most commonly right ventricle, or they can be communicated communicated with the right atrium also. That is called rupture of sinus of polysalva aneurysm. So this is very rare left to right shunt uh, vision. And then the last one is a coronary artery fistula. Now there are two main uh, two coronary arteries are there, right coronary artery and left main coronary artery. After their origin in their proximal course, if this coronary artery uh, get dilated and forms aneurysm, again similarly uh, opens into the right ventricle or right atrium. So that is called coronary artery fistula. So this rupture of sinus of Alzheimer, aneurysm and coronary artery fistula they are very rare among the all left to right shunt lesions. So to summarize, shunt lesions are common among all congenital heart defects. VSD is the commonest. So most of them present with congestive heart failure, failure to thrive, rest, recurrent respiratory infection, suppress such cycle exercise, intolerance, increased precordial activity that can be noted by the mother. So VSD, PDF, mostly they present early in the childhood, ASD, usually remains asymptomatic and ASD can present later in the childhood. On cardiovascular examination, if the loud pansostelic murmur in left parasternal area is noted, then diagnosis is likely VSD. If continuous machinery type of murmur in pulmonary area with bounding peripheral pulses, wide pulp pressure, the diagnosis is very obvious, it is PDA or patent doctor arteries. Soft systolic murmur in pulmonary area, but characteristic second heart sound which is fixed and wide, it is ASD. So most of these left to right shunt lesions required one time intervention. And what is the choice of closure is surgical closure is preferred, but in some defects device closure is also possible. After closure also we need to follow this patient three to four times in first year, then thereafter every three to five year. But timely diagnosed, timely intervened, they are having excellent prognosis. So, few questions. Uh, what are the doses of endomethacin ibuprofen which are used in the treatment of the patent ductus cases? So, dose of endomethacin is 0.2 mg per kg, single uh, first dose on first day and second and third day we are giving 0.1 mg per kg with infusion. Ibuprofen can be given orally, doses 10 mg per kg on first day, on second and third day 5 mg per kg per day. What are the syndromes which are associated with ASD? So there are possible congenital heart defect can be associated with certain syndromes. So ASD is associated with 3 to 4 syndromes like Poltoram syndrome, Kelly's Van Crevel syndrome, or Credu Chad syndrome, or trisomy 13 and 80 can be having ASD as a congenital heart defect. So, after all this discussion, we have discussed a synodic congenital heart defect. But for that, what is the normal SpO2 level? So, SpO2 or oxygen saturation level is 95 or more, that is normal. If value is 94 or below, then it comes in synodic range. Less than 90, there will be the confirmed sinuses. 91 to 94, so it is borderline. We have to again take saturation two more times. So, last question is, which are the drugs which are used in the drug dependent congenital heart defects? So, all of you know the drugs uh, which are used in the closure of ketan ductus arteriosus. But in certain condition, we require ductus arteriosus keep, to keep open to maintain the hemodynamic stability. So, which is the drug which is used in the uh, maintaining patency of ductus arteriosus? So, this drug is PGE1, prostaglandin E1. So, that maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus. So, that is the end of the today's session. Thank you very much. So next part we will discuss obstructive heart lesions. Thank you.